There is a door inside the Davis house that is sacred to me. It looks just like an ordinary door on the outside. And if you open it, all you're going to see is the inside of the closet where our water heater is stored. But you will also find a story that God has been writing for many years. The inside of that door is filled with hash marks. And beside each one is a name and a date where we have marked the height of our four sons. In fact, just this weekend, I lined the boys up and I grabbed the Sharpie and I drew a line above each one of their heads. And then they always love to compare notes about who has grown the most since the last time we measured. Day by day, my sons look pretty much the same to me. They don't go to bed at night and wake up noticeably taller. But month by month, year to year, And pretty soon, decade to decade, my sons are growing. From tiny little babies that somehow once fit inside my belly to grown men, one of whom already towers well above his mama and the others are on their way. This physical reality that children grow little by little, inch by inch, until they reach maturity is a beautiful picture of a spiritual reality that God is doing in you right now. And he's doing it in me too. This is A Deep Well with Aaron Davis. I'm Shannon Painter. On our last episode, Aaron reminded us that our lives are short and we need to focus our attention on things that will last. But while we do that, we also need to remember we can never do enough. That's why we need Jesus. Erin's about to explain as she continues the series, Stay Awake. We're walking through 1 Thessalonians. This is a letter written by Paul, which I have come to see as our Christian manifesto of hope, because it reminds us over and over and over and over again, stay awake. Jesus is coming back. Our ultimate hope is in the return of Christ. It's in the moment when he will turn the world he has made right side up. But the book of Proverbs tells us that hope deferred makes the heart sick. So where can we put our hope today, right now, while we wait? I want to pick up our study of this little book in chapter four, and I want to repeat my challenge to you to read all of 1 Thessalonians every day that you listen to this series. It's a quick read. It should take you less than 10 minutes. Now, I'm not skipping chapter three in this series because it's uninspired or unimportant. That's why I want you to read the whole book. I want you to catch all of it. It's part of God's perfect word. And Paul repeats his plea for Christians to live holy lives as we wait for Jesus's return in chapter three. But as we consider how to stay awake, I want to drill down on one little phrase that's repeated in chapter four. And the phrase is, more and more. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 3. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. Remember, these are commendable Christians. Couldn't we use some more of those? They weren't like the foolish Galatians to which Paul wrote, who has bewitched you? Paul wrote in verse one that they were already walking to please God. I love the listeners of the deep well. I love getting to meet you. I love hearing what God is doing in your life. And I love that you are already walking to please God. You want to have your Bible open. You want to love your neighbor. You want to hear the voice of the Spirit and obey. You want to help your church thrive. You want to help the church thrive. You want to be a woman of joy. You want people to look at you and see Jesus. Good. Listen to what Paul wrote next. I'm still in verse one. He said, do so more and more. Now, some of you are built like me, and when you read something like that in the Bible, your first reflex might be anxiety. 
Like the Bible is telling you, you have to do more for Jesus. So if that's how you feel as you read that phrase more and more, let me encourage you to keep reading. Listen to verses two and three again. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. Sanctification is the process of progressively becoming like Jesus. And I have some great news. It's not something you achieve in your own strength. It is something that is accomplished supernaturally by the Holy Spirit within you. Oh, that's really good news. Jump with me to 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. I have that underlined in my Bible. From one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. You are being transformed right this very moment. Now, you're not transforming yourself. You've tried and I've tried. We can't change even the smallest of habits without Herculean effort and a high failure rate. But you are being transformed, Paul wrote here in 2 Corinthians. You are being transformed into the image of God. And the text says that this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. The Spirit of God is transforming you into the image of God by the power of God. Oh, I want to say that again. The Spirit of God is transforming you into the image of God by the power of God. This is sanctification. And why is God sanctifying you? Our text in 1 Thessalonians 4 told us, because he wants to. It's his will. It's his plan. It's his desire to conform you into the image of his son while you wait for his return. Scripture calls us not to waste the wait, but God is not wasting the wait either. He will use every day between now and his return to sanctify you and to sanctify me. Sanctification is not a matter of will, and it is not a process of your own strength, but neither is it passive. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 again. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus, that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. And then I love what he says next in verse 2. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. I've already defined sanctification as the process of progressively becoming like Jesus. That's the Spirit's job. But knowing God's word and doing it, that's our job. That's how we participate in the transformation. Paul was saying you already know what to do. It's already been revealed to you. And you just do it more and more as you wait for Christ's return. And that participation, that knowing what God wants us to do and doing it more and more, that is why the deep well exists. That we would know our Bibles, and when we know our Bibles, we can live what the Bible says. I met a farmer's wife many years ago, and she told me that one night her husband turned to her in bed, and with tears in his eyes, he said, Baby, have I done enough? What he meant was, have I done enough for Jesus? Have I been good enough? Have I prayed enough? Have I read my Bible enough? Have I shared the gospel enough? Have I been to enough Bible studies? Have I volunteered at enough vacation Bible schools? Have I memorized enough verses? I bet you feel that pressure too. I do. That very night the farmer died in his sleep. He fell asleep, worried that he had not done enough, and he woke up in glory and realized that Jesus had already done all that counts. The call of Scripture here is not to run ourselves ragged, trying to accumulate enough good deeds for Jesus. This is why we have to know our whole Bibles. This is why we have to be anchored in the true gospel, 
Paul is not saying, Jesus is coming back, so I need you to do more and 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 more. That's not what he's saying. But he is encouraging us to keep doing what we know and to ask God to help us do it more and more. As a fruit of becoming more and more like him, we do the things we know to do more and more. It's like fruit that gets riper and riper and more juicy and more ready until Jesus returns. Paul went on to list some very specific evidences of sanctification. And again, I'm encouraging you to read this whole book. So I would encourage you to read that list. It's in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8. But I want to pick up this chapter of our epistle with verses 9 and 10. Again, I'm in 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 and 10. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. There's those words again, more and more. Paul's encouragement, again, in light of the big idea of this book, which is that Jesus is coming back. In light of Jesus' imminent return, walk to please God more and more and love one another more and more. Okay, sign me up. Plug in something to my spiritual USB drive and make me walk like Jesus fully today, right? Make me love others like Jesus did fully today. Let's get this sanctification process finished already. I'm sure I am not the only woman in the world who is frustrated by the speed at which God is sanctifying me. But that's just not how it works. He doesn't do it automatically. This more and more phrase, it means by a greater measure, a higher degree, a process. Don't do it all today. You can't do it all today. You're growing. God is growing you, but more and more. It reminds me of another song I used to sing when I was a little girl. Little by little, bit by bit, I am trusting the Lord. It's a process. Remember from 2 Corinthians 3.18, that Paul describes the sanctification process as moving from one degree of glory to another. Little by little, moment by moment, sometimes, often, so slowly that it feels like you are not being sanctified at all. Why does Jesus sanctify us so slowly? If we know that he wants us to be conformed into his image, if we know that he wants us to live and love like he lives and loves, why doesn't he just download all of that into our hard drives when we surrender our lives to him? Well, one reason is that we would stay awake to our need for God. I love how John Piper put it. You're going to love this quote too. John Piper said, You can get in God's face about this. He was talking about our slow sanctification. You can get in God's face about this and say, I don't like the plan. I don't like the plan that you leave me unsanctified and battling every day with depletion, having to be renewed on grace every day. I don't like the plan. And I just like to be done with the battle. Now, it's hard for me to imagine actually getting in God's face and pointing a finger and saying, why won't you sanctify me quicker? but we can feel frustrated, right? And Piper said this response, and God would say, well, that's the plan. And the reason it's the plan is I'm going to get some glory in your life. If I didn't do it this way, you'd get uppity about it. You'd think you had it made. You'd think your strength was coming from you. And then listen to this, soak in this for a minute. Piper said that God would respond to us by saying, The fact that you've run out of gas every day puts you in the station, and the station is me. 1 Thessalonians isn't just a letter that asks us to stay awake to Jesus' return. It's also a letter that reminds us to stay awake to what He is doing within us while we wait. I know you'd like to be further down the line. I know that there are patterns of sin in your life that you desperately want to be free of. 
I know that you wish you spoke more gracious words. I know that you wish that you were sharing the gospel with others more often. I know that you wish your appetites for God were stronger than your appetites for the things of the world in some areas. I know that because I feel those things too. But he is transforming us. He is shaping us into the image of his son, and he's doing it in such a way that reminds us how much we need him. When your flesh is weak and you must battle temptation again, sister, stay awake. He is sanctifying you. When you're battling bitterness for a hurt that you thought you dealt with a long time ago, my pastor just this Sunday stepped up to the pulpit and said, I'm going to teach on forgiveness. And I thought, oh man, what's the spirit going to expose in my heart that I thought I had dealt with? When the Lord does that for you, stay awake. He's sanctifying you. As I said before, when your spiritual appetites are all out of whack and you don't really want to keep walking to please God and love others more and more, stay awake. He's sanctifying you. When you feel enslaved to self and isn't self a terrible taskmaster, and when you feel you cannot be set free from your obsession with yourself, your, your narcissistic thoughts, stay awake. He's sanctifying you. When your mind is filled with doubts, as mine often is, of his goodness, even though I know he is good, I know that I know that I know he is good. And still sometimes my mind plays tricks on me and I struggle to believe that's true. If that happens for you, stay awake. He is sanctifying you. When you are deeply discouraged and you cannot seem to focus on what is good and pure and true and lovely, stay awake. He is sanctifying you. Degree by degree, hash mark by hash mark, moment by moment, He is conforming you into the image of his son for his glory. And if these thoughts about sanctification feel disconnected from our first Thessalonians theme of waiting for the return of Christ, hop with me to one more Pauline epistle, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable. And this is a promise, sisters. We shall be changed. If sanctification has a finish line, and it does, it's the return of Jesus. Not before. I wish it was before, but it isn't. But the trumpet's going to blow. The dead are going to be raised, and we will finally and forever be fully changed into the image of our Savior. For now, your spiritual progress might feel like nothing more than a few hash marks on the door, but you are learning God's Word more and more. You are living it out more and more. You are learning to love God and his image bearers more and more. And he is doing a more miraculous, more transformational work in you than you could ever imagine. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the sanctification process. It is painful and it is tedious, and it is slow. And from our human perspective, it seems that you aren't doing much inside of us, but we trust your word. We trust that you are moving us from one degree of glory to another, and that's part of how you are using the weight in our lives. And we trust that when you come back for us, the process will be complete, and we will finally be as we were made to be all along. Thank you for that promise. We trust you and we trust your promise. 
It's in your name I pray. Amen. It is so easy to fall into one of two traps. On one hand, we can be discouraged that we can never do enough to make God happy. On the other hand, we can stop doing the good works God has called us to do. Aaron has been giving us a biblical view of sanctification to help us avoid those extremes. That teaching is part of the series, Stay Awake. Shannon, you are involved in helping women grow in their sanctification. Tell us more about that. Aaron, I get the opportunity to disciple women through body stewardship. Mm. We meet together typically once a week, and we take a look at what God's Word has to say about how we care for the bodies that He's entrusted to us. And any of us who have ever tried to learn to steward our body know how slow that process can be. So that's a pretty good picture for what we've been talking about, sanctification being so slow. And you've had a tremendous impact in my life in that area. In fact, we did a whole podcast series about it called Embodied. Have you heard feedback from the women you disciple after that's related to that series? I had a lot of people that I got to talk to because of that series that we did. And it was so exciting to see some of the fruit of how God used that to encourage, to challenge other women, and just to see some of the fruit of what He's done in my life and in your life as well. Yeah, that's why we do this. I mean, we don't just talk into these microphones because we think we have something amazing to say in our own strength, Mm -hmm. but because we want to encourage women and point them to the Word and remind them that God really is doing something in you. Uh, when it doesn't seem like it's true. So that series, you can find it at reviverhearts.com slash the deep well. You can search for seasons there and you'll find embodied. In fact, you can hear all the archives of the deep well at reviverhearts.com slash the deep well, or this is my favorite way, subscribe to the deep well on your podcast app. All right. It's time for the part of the program we call Aaron Unscripted. Okay. Aaron, a lot of things in life we want to have happen very quickly. Mm. But you mentioned that our sanctification, our being made like Jesus, happens as a process that God takes us through over a long period of time. But you also aren't saying that we should just let go and let God. Would you talk a little bit more on how we cooperate with the Holy Spirit and let that process happen? Yeah. I mean, you said we want most things in life to happen quickly. I want all things in life to happen quickly. And (laughs) there's nothing I want to happen quickly more than I want to be transformed into the image of Jesus. I just, I want it for me. I want it for the people I love. I, I want it to give God glory. I, I just want it to happen quickly. And it hasn't happened that way. It's happened slowly over time. But the other extreme is God's going to do what God's going to do. And just kind of Jesus take the wheel kind of approach to it. It's neither. This is why the Christian life requires walking in step with the spirit. It's true that the spirit is enabling me to be changed. It's true that ultimately God does all of the heavy lifting in our lives, but it's also true that he invites us into the process. And I'm fond of saying something is only legalism if you're doing it to earn salvation If you're doing something as a fruit or a byproduct of your salvation, as part of the transformation God's doing, then it's not legalism anymore. So I don't read my Bible because God's impressed with me when I do. I read my Bible because that's a means of grace that God has given me by which he is transforming me. I don't go to church because like there's some attendance chart in heaven where God's keeping track of how many Sundays in a row I've been to church. I go to church again because that's a means of grace by which God is transforming me. Uh, He's using the preaching of my pastor. He's using the prayers of the people I go to church with. He's using their testimonies to change me. And so we get to participate with him in the sanctification process. But if we try to do it in our own strength, it's a nightmare. We will be frustrated I will veer towards deep discouragement. I will convince myself God's not doing anything at all. Instead, he says, let's walk this out. Let's be Mm -hmm. on a journey of you knowing me more and more. And as you know me more and more, then you can bear my image more and more. And so it doesn't always feel like a gift or an invitation, but that's really 
what God invites us to in the sanctification process. I've thought before about gardening when it comes to our sanctification. When you plant a garden, and I wish I was a better gardener than I am, but well, come to Missouri, I'll tell you, how. I'll show you the way. <laughs> we just have rocks here in the soil in Texas, oh. <laughs> but you can't just go outside and throw some seeds on the ground and expect a garden to pop up. There are things that you have to do. You have to till the soil. You have to mm. fertilize it. You have to make sure it's watered. You have to guard against pests and things that can threaten the life of your seeds. But ultimately, you can't make the seeds come up and yeah. grow into plants. God has to do that. And he miraculously does that underneath the soil, which is something that's so cool. So our participation in it is, like you mentioned, we get to do some of the work and the habits that help foster that growth. But at the end of the day, he produces that in us and makes it happen. I love a good garden analogy. And I think that's a beautiful one. And you know what? There are weeds that like sprout up in a day and mm -hmm. they don't produce much. <laughs> They're weeds. And so that's that cultivating. That's another word for maybe what God invites us to do in the sanctification process is be a part of what he's cultivating in our lives and enjoy the process. Uh, marvel at what he's doing instead of thinking that the goal is just to get to some finish line. Philippians 2, 12 through 13 comes to mind. It says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, I don't think that means we're supposed to white knuckle our way to glory and be like, I am going to sanctify myself. But that it's a process. Verse 13 says, for it is God who works in you both to will and work for his good pleasure. So there's a duality that can be a little bit hard to define, which is, yes, I am supposed to work out my own salvation and I'm supposed to be sober about it, but it's ultimately God who does it and ultimately God who gives me the desire to do it. So it's like so many things in the Christian life, it's both and. Yes, we participate, but no, we don't do it in our own strength. And ultimately God is doing the work, but he invites us into the work. And that healthy approach to sanctification where we're needy, we know that God ultimately does it, but we enjoy joining him in the cultivation brings a lot of energy and health and vitality to the Christian life, I think. Yeah. Aaron, I keep thinking of the story you told about the farmer and wondering what if someone listening relates to that? Have I done enough? What would you say to someone that feels that weight? Well, the farmer is real and the farmer's wife is real. I really did meet her and we had a great conversation about the gospel. And she felt like ultimately her husband did understand that it was Jesus's work on the cross that saved him. He didn't earn it. He wasn't responsible for his own salvation. But in a moment of physical exhaustion or mental weakness, he his mind kind of went on this hamster wheel of, did I do enough? Did I do enough? Did I do it enough? And she had a lot of hope that he he was with Jesus and he understood and responded to the gospel. But I can understand that hamster wheel. At this point in my life, as we're recording this, I've been walking with the Lord for more than 30 years. And I can articulate the gospel more clearly than I could even when I surrendered my life to Jesus. I love to use the adage from the Reformation. It's grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone, period. Or maybe we want an exclamation point there. You know, we don't earn it. We don't deserve it. And I know that's true, but I can certainly still have moments of feeling like the farmer did, which is, did I do enough? Did I do enough? Did I do enough? And I find that it's helpful to just get to the answer I'm trying to avoid, which is no, no, mm -hmm. I have not done enough. No, I am not good enough. No, I have not volunteered enough hours in kids ministry <laughs> to balance the scale. No, the answer is no, I am not enough. That's such a dangerous message coming at women right now of you are enough. And the, it, the opposite is true. So in facing that, that compared to Christ's holiness, I do not deserve salvation, then I can either go to total despair and wallowing or what is true, which is that despite my 
in sufficiency, Christ is more than sufficient. And so when you find your mind on in that cycle of just questioning, does God really love me? Can God really love me? Have I done enough to get into heaven? Have I done enough to deserve his grace? I would say, get yourself to what is true, which is the answer is no, you haven't. But his love for you is not based on you. It's based on him. And with everything, when we will look to him, we will look to his character. When we will look to what he has told us is true in scripture, our eyes open and we can see things as they really are. So that's part Mm -hmm. of what the Bible does. It defibrillates our hearts when we're in like code blue, you know, like we're believing things that are just not true. We're despairing over our current realities. The Bible says, ah, but remember the cross. Remember what Jesus said on the cross, which is that is finished. Remember how over and over in the New Testament, we're reminded that he paid the price for our sins, that we might be free. And I wish that farmer had done that that night. I wish he'd maybe gotten himself to the book of Romans and been reminded, oh, yes, but the free grace of God is eternal life because of what Jesus did. He realized it when he opened his eyes in glory. I, he never asked that, am I enough question again? Because when we're in the presence of Jesus, we see that he's taken care of it. That's a good, ring, beautiful reminder for those of us, especially that are the type A, or as you said, the type double A double A sister. personalities. <laughs> <laughs> Shannon, at the end of this episode, everybody had lumps in their throats. And when I was preparing this teaching, I wasn't necessarily expecting the episode on sanctification to be the one that God used to stir our hearts. What do you think it is about thinking about our sanctification and how slow it can feel that can make us feel? sad and frustrated and happy and all of the emotions at the same time. You know, I remember you talking about measuring your boys on the wall or by your door. And I had this thought while you were talking about that, like, Lord, sometimes I just feel like I'm going backwards, Mm. that I'm not making any progress because it can be so slow and it can feel so frustrating and discouraging because you can't see progress while you're in it at times. Yeah. And that can feel really discouraging and hard and overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah. To Back to the hash marks on the door. I mean, my boys all want to be over six foot tall now, you mm-hmm. know, and Ezra's five. So that would be not <laughs> good for his development. But, but they, you know, they kind of peacock like boys do and stretch themselves up and they always think I'm not growing. I'm not growing as fast as my friends. I'm not as tall as the other kids on the basketball team. But then when we line them up against that door, there's hard evidence that yes, you are in fact growing. And I think part of the, the hard part about sanctification is our desire is good and right. We want to be like Jesus. We want to shed our sin nature and the things that make us not look like Jesus. And we want to be made into his image. We want to stop screaming at the kids. We really do want that. We want to um, obey Jesus quicker. We really do want that. And it's hard to understand. Well, okay, God, then why is that not your will that that happened today? Because those are really good things. And uh, you mentioned going backwards. It doesn't always feel linear either. Right. But a day by day, year by year, I'm not who I want to be, but I am not who I was and all to God's glory. And so if we can keep that perspective and for me, studying these passages was so helpful to realize that part of the reason he built the sanctification that way was so that we would cling to him so that we would depend on him. So we would not come up with some human system of like 30 steps to becoming like Jesus Mm -hmm. and think that we did it in our own strength. So he's using it, of course. You mentioned we want our growth to be linear. And that's certainly something I come across regularly in my job as a personal trainer. Mm. We think that we're just going to get stronger and faster and more fit in a linear fashion. And the reality is, There are injuries. Life happens. People in our family get sick. 
we have to put things on the back burner at times. And so it isn't linear and that can feel frustrating sometimes. And I can see how that is in our sanctification process as well. We think I should just continually go in a straight line to be more like Jesus all the time and that we aren't going to be human in the process and still make mistakes. And where is our need for a savior in that? Yeah. It's like, well, I just take one step, then the next step, then the next step, then the next step, and then I arrive. Well, then that causes us to forget that we're just dust and that even the breath in our lungs is given by God, that we are weak. We are conceived in sin and sinner since birth. These are all things that scripture teaches us. And so, of course, it's not linear or speedy because of where we start and because of how needy we are. But isn't God gracious to never just throw up his hands and think these puny children of mine who just cannot get it right, I'm going to give up on them. Never. He continues to love us and shape us and grow us and challenge us into his image, even knowing how weak and frail we are, which is such a tremendous mercy. And I think that's where the spillover of emotions came for me Mm. when confronted with feeling how inadequate and needy I am, that I think he's still kind and shows us grace. And it's his kindness that leads us to repentance and causes us to continue to grow. Yeah. Yeah. There was a Piper quote that I read in the episode. And the first time I read it, it was like my mind exploded. Like there's a line in this Piper says it better than this, but the point of your frailty is get you into the garage and I'm the garage and realizing like even my weakness is a mercy if it gets me to the Lord and um, that he is ready and willing to accept me and to change me and transform me. And the moment that we're not emotional about that, the moment that that we take that for granted and that feels like no big deal, we need the Lord to soften our hearts again. So I thought your emotion was really beautiful. Erin, this series has been great so far. What can we expect on the next episode? Well, you can expect me to get out a fire hose of hope. We're going to talk about why in light of Jesus's return, we need to stay hopeful. The Deep Well with Erin Davis is part of the Revive Our Hearts podcast family, calling women to freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.